Great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, my name is Samuel Borby. As is mentioned, I am a urologist and I chair the Genital Urinary Cancer Program at Garnet Health in Middletown, New York, uh, formerly Orange Regional Medical Center. Before I get to the uh, talk entitled The Basics of Beyond, I want to take this opportunity to uh, offer a very heartfelt thanks to um, Luis and uh, Karen Abramson. Um, when I met you less than a year ago, you had this idea uh, to come up with a group to help men of, of Orange County um, get access to care locally. And within a very short period of time, you've sprung up this, I think, fantastic idea and organization. I'm very impressed with all the uh, effort and work and love that you put into it. So thank you. And thank you also to all the board members for all the time and effort you're putting into volunteering for this great organization. Next slide, please. So what is prostate cancer? Well, obviously prostate cancer is the cancer that affects the prostate gland. And all people who are born genetic male, meaning that have the uh, sex chromosome XY, will have a prostate gland. And the prostate gland's only purpose, as far as we understand it today, is to provide some components of semen so for procreation. Next slide, please. So this is a cross-section of the uh, male body on the left, the pelvis specifically. And um, as you can see, the prostate gland is sort of wedged underneath the bladder, uh, behind the pubic bone, in front of the rectum. It's pretty much the deepest organ in your body, if you're a man. And uh, the bladder, when it empties itself of urine, uh, the urine will go through the urethra, and that urethra actually passes through the prostate and uh, the seminal vesicle, which you can see on the uh, zoom in of the cross section on the right, those are basically the semen sac that store the semen. And that semen is also emptied through the urethra. So, you know, we have some important structures running through there. Um, a common question I get asked by people, by patients, is I've had a colonoscopy, so do I need to have? prostate cancer screening or isn't that the same thing a colonoscopy and a, a you know a transrectal ultrasound or so there those are i want to flesh out right now that those are completely different colonoscopies while they do go into the rectum they are they are not looking at prostates or prostate cancer in any way so having a colonoscopy doesn't give you any sort of um, benefit in terms of prostate cancer screening Next slide, please. So just how common is prostate cancer? Well, unfortunately, extremely common. Um, the latest data we have from 2020 is that there are almost uh, 200,000 new cases of prostate cancer per year in America. And um, the good news is that there are only about 30,000 deaths from prostate cancer per year in America. So there's a big uh, disconcordance there. That being said, um, one in about one in nine men uh, will be diagnosed with prostate cancer during his lifetime. And about one in 30 to one in 40 will eventually succumb to prostate cancer. The good news is that uh, more than three million men in the U.S. today have been diagnosed at, with prostate cancer and are still alive today. And that's a big one. So what does that mean? It means that most men are dying with prostate cancer and not of prostate cancer. Next slide, please. Um, this slide puts things in perspective. On the left-hand side, it shows uh, on the top left, basically, the 
total number of cases per year. And actually, unfortunately, prostate cancer has the dubious distinction of being the most common non-skin cancer uh, in men at uh, 190,000 uh, or almost 200,000 per year. I liken it basically to the male equivalent of breast cancer, uh, which is the most common cancer in women. Again, um, harking back to what I just said, if you look at the lower part of the chart, you see that although uh, prostate cancer was number one by far for number of new cases or incidents per year, um, it is uh, not the biggest cancer killer of men. That distinction goes to lung and uh, bronchus cancers. However, it is still the second most common uh, cancer killer, uh, which is something that we want to change. Next slide, please. So how does prostate cancer behave? Well, the good news is that most prostate cancers grow slowly. However, uh, some prostate cancers can grow and spread quickly. Sometimes the difficult part for us urologists and medical oncologists and other doctors is determining which are the cancers that are gonna grow slowly versus grow quickly. It's not always apparent. Um, as I mentioned, not just some, but actually most men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer will die with it and not of it. Um, but what happens if somebody is diagnosed with prostate cancer and they decide for whatever reason not to undergo treatment, um, either due to advanced age or other reasons? Well, we know that the prostate cancer will eventually creep beyond the prostate capsule um, into the fat around the prostate. Uh, sometimes it will grow into the bladder in rare cases. Sometimes it will actually go uh, sort of grow beneath itself into the rectum. And uh, commonly it will spread to, spread to the lymph nodes, which are the drainage tissue, which runs alongside the prostate. And from there, it could, it could go anywhere, uh, but it tends to have a favor, favorite spot being the bone, uh, the bones of the spine, the bones of the skull, the chest, but it can affect uh, really any bone in your body. And then eventually at some point, it can spread to ev literally every single organ of your body. Next slide, please. What are the risk factors for prostate cancer? Um, there are several that are known. Some are more important than others. By far, the most important risk factor is age. I'm sorry, the presentation went into, thank you. So the older you are, uh, the much higher chance uh, you have to develop prostate cancer. In fact, um, study, autopsy studies have been done. And if you are over 80 uh, and you pass away for another reason, let's say we took 100 men that were 80 and over that passed away for reasons besides prostate cancer, and you did a autopsy and looked at their prostate, well, about 60% of those men would actually have some element of prostate cancer in their prostate. Obviously, this is something that didn't kill them, so it wasn't aggressive, but it is something that becomes extremely prevalent uh, as we age. I think uh, many people know that uh, your racial background, can you go back please? Your racial background is uh, an important uh, risk factor. I'm going to get, going to get uh, more into that in the um, uh, next slide. And then uh, a very, very important one is having a family history of prostate cancer. So um, the risks uh, increase sort of exponentially the more family members you have. If you have uh, one family member, uh, for example, a brother, um, versus if you have 
a brother and a father, or if you have a father and a grandfather and an uncle and a brother, well, your risk goes up like this. Um, not only does a family history of prostate cancer is an important risk factor, but other cancers as well. You wouldn't think so, but having a female relative that has had breast cancer or even a female or male relative that has had colon cancer, specifically certain types um, can also predispose one to developing prostate cancer. There are um, environmental factors such as uh, diet and smoking and obesity that do seem to play a role, but not probably not as much as in other cancers. For example, smoking is a major risk factor for a lung cancer and bladder cancer, but it's thought to be much less important for prostate cancer. But don't start smoking. I didn't tell you to do that. Um, and then finally, um, there is some question about um, whether having been exposed to Agent Orange um, can predispose one to developing prostate cancer. This uh, is questionable. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, prostate cancer is um, not commonly seen in younger men. Um, however, um, it is, um, uh, I have seen men detected with prostate cancer in their 40s. And that is a, a testament to their courage for actually going out and getting screened in their 40s. A lot of men that age are scared. But if you have a strong family history, uh, or other risk factors, I encourage you to get tested uh, young, starting at least having one sort of screen or one visit with the urologist in your 40s. Um, and as I also mentioned, the incidence uh, rises rapidly um, after each decade beyond uh, 50 years. Next slide, please. So the incidence of prostate cancer is higher in African-American men than in white men. Um, in the uh, early 2012-2016, well, there was approximately 177 cases per 100,000 African men uh, per year, uh, compared to uh, almost half that, 102 per 100,000 for white men. And unfortunately, um, African-American males not only is prostate cancer more common, but they seem to have higher mortality from prostate cancer, uh, even if um, adjusting for things like uh, the inability to access care, even when that's taken into account, they still seem to have higher mortality from prostate cancer, which is very important to keep in mind. Next slide, please. So um, I mentioned that diet can play a role in prostate cancer. Um, so this is one thing that you can actually, you know, you can't modify your race, you can't modify your age, your family history, but diet you can modify if you want to. And um, a diet high in fat, especially saturated fat or fats of animal origin, can be associated with a higher risk of prostate cancer. Next slide, please. That being said, if diet can play, play a negative role, meaning it could predispose you to prostate cancer, could there be some things that you could do um, or take in your diet to prevent prostate cancer? And um, three ingredients, let's say, or, or three uh, substances have been looked at. These are lycopenes, uh, vitamins, uh, such as minerals, such as selenium and vitamin E, and tea. Next slide, please. So let's talk about tea here for a minute, and I apologize if the uh, font uh, I'm realizing now might be a little bit small, but I'll, I'll summarize the slide. Basically, um, in Asian countries where people drink a lot of green tea, it was found that prostate cancer mortality rates were some of the lowest in the entire world. Interestingly, when men from these uh, Asian countries moved to the United States and 
became part of the melting pot and lost their dietary habits, their risk of prostate cancer did increase. So this suggests from population studies that uh, green tea may actually help protect against prostate cancer in Asian populations. Um, I want to caution people that there hasn't really been any proof that drinking green tea will affect men of other racial backgrounds. Next slide, please. Lycopene is another interesting one. Uh, this is a natural pigment found in various fruits and vegetables, uh, notably tomatoes, but also avocados, guavas, and watermelon. And lycopene, without getting bogged down too much into scientific detail, can, thank you, uh, will, will actually end up blocking the production of the testosterone receptor. Testosterone is very crucial in prostate cancer. Prostate cancer cells actually feed on testosterone. And it has been shown in the laboratory uh, settings that um, lycopene found in tomatoes can actually diminish the growth of prostate cancer cells. That being said, things in the laboratory do not always translate to real life. And in uh, large studies, uh, overall, there was not found to be an association between uh, dietary intake of this lycopene and the risk of prostate cancer. That's for all comers. But men with a family history of prostate cancer may benefit from lycopene consumption. Next slide, please. Um, I want to um, bring everyone's attention to this uh, study, which I thought was uh, very interesting. Um, it was called the SELECT trial. We all heard about it in residency and continue to hear about it. Um, it actually was a trial that looked at uh, something called vitamin E and selenium. And basically, this was given to these two um, vitamins were given either individually together. Um, and it was, they studied whether these men who uh, received these vitamins versus men who received the placebo, were, were they either more or less at risk of developing prostate cancer. And this was a fairly well done, rigorous study that was 10 years long. And if you can go to the next slide, please. The results were quite surprising. The next slide, please. Um, that when you uh, compare men who are given vitamin E to men who are given basically a sugar pill, which is a placebo, these men actually had a higher risk of prostate cancer, which you would, I would be surprised at. Why would taking a vitamin uh, increase your risk of prostate cancer? Well, it does. Um, and um, selenium, the other vitamin they looked at, had essentially no effect. Next slide, please. So what is the take home message here? Well, um, if you are an Asian man, and I would say especially if there is a family history of prostate cancer, regular uh, green tea consumption may decrease your risk. Um, the uh, lycopene found in tomatoes may decrease prostate cancer risk, especially if you have a family history of prostate cancer. Look, I don't think it hurts to eat tomatoes unless you have an allergy. So, um, you know, you may not get a, a major benefit, but I don't see a, a major downside either. So um, I encourage men to to uh, eat tomatoes, not to go overboard, but if it's something you like, might as well enjoy it. And vitamin E and selenium seem to have no beneficial effect on prostate cancer. In fact, vitamin E actually can have a negative effect. Next slide, please. So a lot of questions, um, I think, exists in the community, you know, how do I know, how would, how would my body tell me that I have prostate cancer? What are some of the early warning signs? Next slide, please. And I'll tell you that usually prostate cancer is detected in people who have absolutely no warning signs. Um, and that's the scary part. Next slide. 
So I'll tell you that if you have a slow urinary stream, if you get urine infections, if you're told that you have an enlarged prostate, if you wake up at night to pee, um, this is not indicative that you have prostate cancer. Um, your risk of prostate cancer is not higher if you have any of those symptoms. Um, in fact, even blood in the urine, while that is alarming and should be looked into for other reasons, because it could indicate other types of cancers or stones, is usually not an indicator of prostate cancer. Now, is it possible to have a uh, enlarged prostate or a slow urine stream or, or waking up at night to pee and also have prostate cancer? Yes, but those symptoms, like I said, do not increase your risk of prostate cancer. They just happen to be uh, associated with having an enlarged prostate, which is not the same thing as prostate cancer. There are two phenomena uh, as men age. One is developing more likely to develop prostate cancer, as I mentioned, but the other one is the prostate will grow. And it's the growing prostate that usually is the responsible for giving um, the uh, symptoms that men experience. Next slide, please. So who should be screened for prostate cancer? I'll tell you that there are many different recommendations for from many different guidelines. Um, whether you're looking at the American Neurological Association, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, the NCCN. Um, in my clinic, generally speaking, I offer prostate cancer screening for men between the ages of 50 to 75. However, I will extend that um, beyond that if you have a good quality of, of life and you would benefit from prostate cancer screening. We want to offer prostate cancer screening to men who would benefit from prostate cancer treatment. If you have multiple medical comorbidities, if you are on oxygen, if you already have advanced, for example, lung cancer, you're probably not going to pass away from prostate cancer. So why complicate your, your life and why worry you by giving you another diagnosis that's not going to affect you? But the general rule of thumb is if you have a 10-year um, or more life expectancy, you are eligible for screening. Um, people that have risk factors, however, such as a family history, like your prostate cancer or certain other types of cancers, being African American, other risk factors can be offered earlier screening in their 40s, as I mentioned, and should probably be screened more intensely, meaning more frequently. Uh, the screening, how I saw a question pop up, how often should men be screened for prostate cancer? It should be done every one to two years. And, um, but when it comes down to it, any man that wants to have a discussion about screening for prostate cancer, I'm happy to do so with them. Next one. Another interesting um, topic is, is there a point for screening for prostate cancer? You might say to yourself, how could that even be a question? Why would you not want to detect men with prostate cancer? You'd be surprised. Uh, actually, back in 2011, 2012, the U.S. Uh, PTF, U.S. Preventive Task Force, which comes up with guidelines, uh, mainly used by primary care doctors, actually recommended against routine screening for prostate cancer because they thought that the, based on certain studies, that the harm outweighed uh, the good. Um, that recommendation was thankfully changed recently. But I want to uh, draw your attention to this graph, which actually I think shows uh, why it's very important to screen men for prostate cancer. And I apologize, it's a very small graph, and um, but I think you can make out that on the left-hand side, uh, really, well, it's the same graph for both white and black populations, but um, on the left-hand side of the graph where the blue line is all the way up near the top, that is the number of uh, people being diagnosed with metastatic prostate cancer in a given year, meaning um, that when you come to the doctor's office, they don't say to you, hey, Mr. Smith, you have prostate cancer, you have a small amount of prostate cancer in your prostate gland, these are your treatment options. Um, metastatic prostate cancer means the cancer, uh, the cat has you know, left the bag, the horse is out of the barn, and um, your treatment options are much more limited. So as you can see, that number 
has actually plummeted. Uh, it, it, there is a sharp decline in the early to mid 90s, and that is exactly when the PSA blood test was introduced and started to be uh, uh, have a mass blow up. And I don't think that is a fluke. Next slide, please. What does prostate cancer screening involve nowadays, and actually for the past 20 years, it involves two things: a rectal exam. Uh, from a, a doctor who's qualified and has examined uh, many prostates, and a simple blood test called PSA. Next slide, please. So, um, a rectal exam takes about 30 seconds. It's, it's not the most uh, pleasant thing in the world, but it's one of those necessary evils that once you have it done, you're going to feel better uh, because you, you'll know that you will have uh, done your, your due diligence for that year. Um, so the urologist is basically healing. He can feel uh, the bottom um, aspect of the prostate gland, which is near the rectum. And uh, we're sort of fortunate because this is actually where most prostate cancer develop on the, on the bottom half. If it was developing on the top half, which happens rarely, it's much harder to detect. Next slide, please. And then I mentioned the PSA blood test. So what is the PSA? That stands for prostate-specific antigen. It is a simple blood test that requires uh, no fasting and has a turnaround time of uh, usually a few hours and uh, is, uh, can detect a number of prostate cancers in a very early stage. Next slide, please. So, is PSA the full story? What do I mean by that? Um, if you have a high PSA, let's say you go to your primary doctor and tells you, Mr. Mr. Jones, your PSA is six, does that mean you have prostate cancer? Absolutely not. In fact, I would say most men that have PSA of six is considered to be elevated, but most men that have PSA, PSA of six actually do not have prostate cancer because there are other reasons for having a high PSA, such as having an enlarged prostate, like I mentioned, the term BPH, uh, which means benign prostatic hyperplasia, that enlarged prostate as you get older, that can cause a high PSA. Uh, having uh, some kind of inflammation, such as a uh, prostatitis or urine infection, uh, even if it's a low grade, something you don't necessarily notice, um, can cause PSA to be high. Having recently had sexual relations or ejaculated can cause PSA to be high. So there, there are uh, numerous causes of high PSA. Another question that people ask me is, doctor, what can I do to bring my PSA down? I'm worried about it. Well, the answer to that question is don't worry about it because if your doctor has determined that you don't have prostate cancer, you don't need to worry about bringing your PSA down. Your PSA, it's not like having high cholesterol or high blood pressure where the actual number itself puts you at risk. A PSA is not a dangerous chemical that if it's circulating in your body is going to cause harm. No, it's just a reflection of what the prostate is doing. So a high PSA in itself is not dangerous and doesn't need to be artificially lower. People have looked at uh, other things besides PSA itself, something called a PSA density, which is actually taking into account the, the size of the prostate. It actually is a division of the PSA number. You divide that by the size of the prostate to get a better idea of, oh, is this person overproducing PSA for a small, having a high PSA in a small gland, prostate gland is obviously much more worrisome than a high PSA in a large gland. So PSA density takes that into account. And then the concept of PSA velocity and PSA doubling time is also, uh, uh, more specific than the PSA alone. These look at how does PSA, the blood test, change over time. Um, for example, I might be more concerned with somebody who in one year goes from a one to a three than somebody who's been at eight for the past five years. Um, so all these things can help us in deciding who is really at risk for, for prostate cancer. Next slide, please. So if there is a concern for prostate cancer, what do I usually uh, offer as the next step? Well, 
I don't usually rely, I'll say usually, I don't usually rely on one PSA because of the reasons I mentioned, if there was some inflammation or other reasons the PSA can be elevated. Uh, we may re repeat the PSA. And um, in the past few years, we've also began to use MRIs of the prostate um, to determine if somebody has prostate cancer. And ultimately, the gold standard is going to be a prostate biopsy. Next slide, please. So how does an MRI work? This is actually a um, reverse image of how uh, patients are usually scanned. Uh, usually, actually, their head is somewhat out of the machine. So people that are claustrophobic, uh, claustrophobic your head is not going to be completely in the machine, but it is, I'm told, still um, an experience that is not very pleasant, um, not because it hurts, but because you have to lay still for 40 minutes and there's this machine that makes a loud noise. But if you can get through it, it will add a lot of valuable information for your, your urologist in trying to determine what's going on in your prostate. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, ultimately, uh, how is prostate cancer diagnosed? It is diagnosed with a biopsy, and traditionally, this is done by placing a probe, which is usually the size of an index finger, um, through the rectum. It usually takes about five to 10 minutes, and the uh, ultrasound probe will help guide a needle to take um, samples from all over the prostate, and especially if there are any um, lesions that are seen on ultrasound, and usually you don't see anything on ultrasound, actually, uh, you're just taking a sample from the entire prostate, but lesions can be uh, biopsied, the entire gland is biopsied, and obviously before, um, Doing the biopsy, you get a, a local numbing with anesthetic. I'll tell you that where in my fellowship, we did a uh, study um, and we asked men, what is the most disturbing thing during a prostate biopsy? And it wasn't the actual biopsy itself. It wasn't the pain of the needle. In fact, most people I find don't have any pain. Um, the most disturbing thing was actually the loud clicks that the biopsy gun made. So that was interesting. Next slide, please. So this is my last slide, and um, I want to um, share some optimism um, because I'll tell you that even within my uh, relatively shorter uh, early career, um, I have seen some dramatic, dramatic changes in uh, prostate cancer. I'll tell you that I remember when I was in medical school, in medical school 15 years ago, and I was doing an elective. Um, one of the top quizzes to the residents was, what option do you have for men that have prostate cancer that is spread to the bone? And there was basically two answers. There was something called mitoxantrum and cabazitac chemo. There was two chemotherapies. That's it. Um, today, there's about at least 10 to 15 different options. Uh, men are living longer and longer and with better quality of life, even with prostate cancer that is spread. Um, so I think that future is going to get only brighter, and I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged. Next slide, please. So if any of you have any uh, questions about prostate cancer, if you want to come in for a discussion, if you want to come in for a screening, I'd be happy to see you. Um, I work at Garden Health, as I mentioned, in Middletown. My office is in the POB building on the third floor. Well, um, if you don't mind, uh, Luis, leaving this number up. We can leave up my uh, office number, 845-333-7575. And um, it's fairly easy to get an appointment with me. Just tell them that uh, you'd like to have an appointment with Dr. Aborby for a prostate check, and I'd be more than happy to see you. Uh, with that, um, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, so uh, should I jump to the questions that I'm seeing on the chat? I'll, I'll, um, I'm going to just uh, go ahead and answer some of these questions. So, um, is prostate cancer a slow-growing cancer? As I mentioned, um, for most people, yes. 
In fact, um, there is something called a MSKCC Memorial Sloan Kettering is actually put together as sort of a calculator that you can plug in things like your age, your uh, how aggressive the prostate cancer was on biopsy, your PSA. I've gone through this experiment and even um, the most uh, aggressive types of prostate cancer, if they are still within the prostate, for the vast majority of men, they're going to still be alive in 10 years, 10 years from diagnosis. So that is a much better prognosis than the vast majority of cancers out there compared to, um, uh, for example, lung cancer, pancreas cancer, brain cancer. Another question that came up is, can prostate cancer cause infertility? You know, it's a very good question, and it's not something that's been looked at um very deeply certainly men that are as we know men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer tend to be older about 50 and 60. a lot of men in that age are done having their families and are not uh interested as much in fertility but uh theoretically it can cause infertility the uh semen ducts can be blocked uh, by cancer growing in them but not only that Certainly after you've had your, if you've had your prostate removed or if you've had radiation therapy, you no longer will have the normal uh, mechanism of ejaculation. And so that doesn't mean that you're sterile. It just means that the sperm will have to be usually extracted from the testicle or in some other way. Um, I have another question here from Carlos. How effective is hormone treatment for prostate cancer? There are um, different ways of manipulating hormones for prostate cancer. As I mentioned, testosterone is the real driver of prostate cancer. And so there are different ways in which that pathway can be inhibited, uh, meaning um, curtailed. So you can stop the production of testosterone. You can actually stop the testosterone from binding to the prostate cancer cells and stimulating them. Um, so overall, um, hormone therapy is very effective. But it's not a usually a uh, cure. It will sort of put the prostate cancer on ice for a while, and for some men, quite a long while. But usually, eventually, the cancer will overcome that um, blockade and start to grow. Any other questions? So how long is radiation treatment for prostate cancer? That, um, that is something that is evolving. There are basically two types of uh, radiation. There is something called uh, external beam radiation, and there's something called brachytherapy. External beam basically involves coming in um, to the facility, the radiation treatment center, uh, usually every day uh, for a number of treatments that can actually be now done in, in as few as five treatments um, and can be as long as 30 to 40 different treatments, depending on the, how the treatment is uh, designed. And that is the external beam therapy. The uh, other type, which is uh, brachytherapy, uh, can be done uh, over a couple of days. Um, I'll tell you that um, brachytherapy, otherwise known as uh, seed uh, brachytherapy is, has sort of fallen out of favor for the most part because the other types of treatments have gotten better. Um, I have a question about uh, checkpoint inhibitors. So um, checkpoint inhibitors are something that is uh, basically, uh, these are immune modulators, so to speak. Uh, these are uh, newer treatments that have come on the horizon uh, in the past few years. Um, and for prostate cancer, they have not made um, major waves yet. They basically work by uh, using the body's immune uh, system to attack prostate cancer. They have been shown to be effective uh, for certain other types of cancers, lung cancer, bladder cancer. And I think probably eventually they will be um, most likely used in prostate cancer, but for the time being, it's not part of the 
major armamentarium. Uh, another question uh, relates to how effective is hormone treatment for prostate cancer. As I mentioned, initially hormone treatment is usually quite effective. We've seen I've seen PSAs that were in the hundreds go down to undetectable uh, just from giving hormone treatment, um, which is very encouraging and nice to see. Um, but that being said. Um, it is not a cure, and usually, eventually, whether it's after some kind of months or sometimes several years, the PSA will start to creep up, meaning the prostate cancer has been able to overcome the therapy. So, uh, if you are considering what are the treatment options, we mentioned uh, if your prostate cancer is localized, there is uh, radiation and surgery is an option. I think that if you are a younger man, and I think that if uh, uh, you are healthy, I think surgery is a great option. And the reason for that um, is that uh, you can get a spinal pathology, meaning we remove your entire prostate gland. You don't, you don't just have a biopsy to align, but we know exactly how far the tumor has spread. We can sample the lymph nodes, which run next to the prostate, and see if the cancer has spread there. Um, and not only that, um, having surgery does not preclude you from having some radiation treatment down the road should the cancer return in the area of the pelvis. Whereas, um, if you've had radiation um, primarily as your initial treatment for prostate cancer, having surgery uh, afterwards can be much more tricky. That being said, surgery is still a uh, radiation, I'm sorry, is still a great treatment for men who want to have. Uh, less of an invasive approach. Um, in fact, the overall survival in most cases is probably the same between radiation and surgery. I have a question here about uh, food. Uh, are there any types of food or diets that I would recommend? Look, um, I think having a healthy, balanced diet overall is is uh, going to be good for you no matter what. Um, so I think not becoming overweight or if you're overweight, going down to a normal weight, um, cutting down on those animal proteins, like I mentioned. And sure, why not? Increase your fruits and vegetables and add add some tomatoes to your diet. And um, I think overall having a balanced diet is, is the key to go. What are some, another question that's popped up, what are some of the physical signs of prostate cancer? Well, as I mentioned, uh, most of the time, there are no physical signs. Uh, but if all of a sudden you have blood in the urine, blood in the semen, or um, frequent urination, weak stream, all of a sudden that might indicate something is going on in your prostate. It's probably going to indicate more likely not prostate cancer, but this benign growth of the prostate, but it might be an indicator of, of prostate cancer. And it'll be worthwhile discussing this with the urologist. Uh, is there any um, any more questions in um, uh, Freddie? Uh, uh, or uh, Michael that um, you've gotten? Um, yeah, my name is Michael Cousy. What are the early warning signs of prostate cancer? So, great question, Michael. Um, for the most part, your early warning sign is when your doctor tells you that you need to have a biopsy. That's, that's what it comes down to is I wouldn't rely on physical symptoms such as trouble urinating or loss of erection as an indicator that you might have prostate cancer. This is something that you really have to leave up to the professional with the PSA blood test and uh, with the rectal exam. Uh, there was a question there uh, sent to uh, Freddie. Um, in regards to uh, uh, candidates, um, uh, uh, Freddie, what, what was that? What, um, was it a uh, uh, in, in immuno, right? Immunotherapy. Uh, 
Um, yeah, um, my name is Fred Ramos. Um, I'm a part of the advisory board. Um, yeah, there was one question um, when we got to uh, whether he was concerned whether he's a can whether or not he can become a candidate for immunotherapy. Right. So these these therapies are um, not commonly used. They can be used in specific indications, meaning men that have advanced prostate cancer. There is a um, cancer vaccine actually, which is the only one that I know of that exists for any type of cancer called Provenge, um, which actually will use your own body's uh, immune system to actually attack cancer cells. Um, this has been out uh, for a while, and but it's not used that commonly. Um, the mortality benefit is not very substantial. Um, then the other type, as somebody mentioned, was you know checkpoint inhibitors. We had sort of covered that. This is something that's more uh, in the research and development stage. I think in the future we might see it more in use. Um, but for the time being, um, immune therapy is not the major treatment of prostate cancer. There was a, a question asked by Kevin, and it was about um, uh, frequent urination. Uh, 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 can that be a sign of prostate cancer besides drinking a lot of water during the day? So frequent urination, I'll tell you, is probably the most common reason that people come to see me. And I'll tell you that uh, I don't know of anybody that I've diagnosed with prostate cancer who's had frequent urination alone as a symptom. Um, so if you have frequent urination, don't think that you have prostate cancer. That should not be the first thing that comes into your head. But it shouldn't negate the fact that you need to have the regular screening that I mentioned. Frequent urination can be a sign of excess fluids, having a small bladder or something called an overactive bladder, consumption of caffeine products or spicy foods, consumption of tobacco products, um, use of diuretic medication um, in the large prostate, urinary infections. There are many, many different causes of frequent urination, and um, prostate cancer is not one of the five causes. Um, uh, Orlando has a great question here, um, and I thank you for asking. Do you think that Orange County men are well served in this area, and is it a big problem here? Look, uh, the numbers don't lie, Orlando, in terms of is it a big problem? I mean, the rates of prostate cancer here are not going to be very different than they are in the city or in Rockland County or in Westchester. It's a very frequent thing. Um, I think that I want to raise awareness for men that they can get as good treatment, and I think and sometimes better, treatments locally in Orange County for prostate cancer uh, compared to what they can get in the city or in Long Island or in Westchester. Um, I want to save men the hassle and the trip, whether you decide to have radiation, surgery, active surveillance, really any treatment we have uh, that you need, we have available and we are good at it. So I think that, you know, the, the, the perception, perception of Orange County men is they may have to cross the bridge or something to get good prostate cancer treatment, and I'm here to dispel that myth, is you absolutely don't. You can get very well, very good treatment locally. Well, um, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Amorby, uh, for your presentation on, on behalf of uh, Cultivating Healing and Justice Initiative, Support Services, Inc. And, um, uh, and uh, um, uh, we are very, very, very happy that um, uh, you were able to come on this platform and and, and educate us on uh, men's health and uh, prostate cancer. Um, and uh, and uh, as we say here, we always stand stand up for prostate cancer uh, as a, uh, as a group, as a support group. And uh, we thank you very much uh, for uh, coming. Um, to um, 
our uh, support group here. Um, well, it, was a, it was a pleasure, and I, and I thank you for giving me this opportunity.